What a great uh, privilege it is for us to get together around the Word of God to look at the signs of the times. Those of us who live in this part of the world see the sea and the waves roaring, sometimes from our living room window, and it's a tremendous sight, uh, awe-inspiring, a little more frightening, sometimes terrifying. And in a world in which the sea and the waves roar, the ecclesia of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be a light shining in a dark place. So let that picture be, well, it's large enough almost uh, in the projection to, to be the real thing, isn't it? A uh, little bit grainy, but uh, you get the idea. This is the metaphor that the Lord Jesus Christ uses uh, that we're going to look at this morning, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear for looking on those things which are coming on the earth. But we're not to be overwhelmed, are we? In Luke chapter 21, we're told we're not to be overwhelmed by the anxiety and, and even depression that the world must feel for the things which are happening. We're told in verse 28 that when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. We're told we are to be alive and awake to the things that are going in, on in the world so that we ourselves are ready for the coming of the Lord. So Luke 21 goes on in verse 34. We shouldn't miss this point where it says, take heed to yourselves. So it's one thing to look at the world, one thing to have a, a view about how bad the world is and the trends that are going on in the world and even to realize why we need the Lord Jesus Christ. But verse 34 is asking us to be more personal, brothers and sisters and young people, in our view of these things. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. I love there is clearly a, a literal aspect to uh, you know, suffering from a hangover and the effects of drunkenness. Surely the Lord Jesus Christ is mainly telling us not to be overcharged with the thinking of the world, which is a thinking of wrong teaching and excess, the cares of this life. So that's what's absolutely possible, isn't it? that we might be so wrapped up, in fact, we may not even be here because we're so wrapped up in the affairs of this life that they press upon us and demand our attention and our energy. Uh, verse 34, so the day come upon you unawares. Verse 36 says, watch ye therefore and pray always that he may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's our hope, that we will be taken out of the terrible tribulations that have to do with Armageddon. And apart from those things, being called to the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ, and as the storm passes by, we'll wait to be re revealed in glory to help our master in the establishment of that kingdom. If we want to be there, if we want to be part of that wonderful kingdom to come, then we have to take heed to ourselves. That's what this day is for. That's what this West Wales Prophecy Day is intended to do, to help us to take stock, to analyze ourselves. We have a, uh, almost a day out to reflect on where we are to take heed to ourselves. We're going to cover three things, just three things. The first is to look at the metaphor of the sea in relation to the sea of nations and to look at scripture indications, the prophetic indications, but what is called the rise of nations and see how that sets the scene for the days in which we live. Secondly, we'd like to look at the swell of the sea, or the, the waves as it's translated. Those forces amongst the peoples of the world that are shaping our lives, the social forces which create the culture and environment in which 
We're desperately trying to educate our young people in godly ways. And the third is to look at the noise of the sea and the surfing of the airwaves and to see how that is affecting us or might affect us and what we have to do to counter it. The sea and the waves roaring. Yeah, there's a bit of a problem with this as a sign of the times. If you search for sea and waves roaring in our magazine, as you go back 150 years, and you find just about every perturbation in society is the sea and the waves roaring. Every strike, every protest. Uh, is that what it's telling us? Because, of course, that sort of thing has been going on for nigh on 2,000 years since the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. One of those general statements, there will be trouble. Uh, or is it something more specific? We're told in verse 25 that the nations will be in distress with perplexity. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And there is absolutely uh, a true observation that there's never been a time like the time in which we live. I mean, yes, there have been wars. There have always been wars. Uh, there have been problems. There have been problems which really are much better now than they've ever been. But in our world, there are crises for which there do seem to be no way out. That is the literal sense of with perplexity. A, a world which has used up the resources. There's never been a time except the time in which we live, where there has been nuclear arms and nuclear proliferation. The prospect of North Korea getting nuclear weapons, of Iran getting nuclear weapons. It's true, isn't it? That what is the way out for Donald Trump? There's no way out. And Perhaps the world isn't taking the prospect seriously enough. And one of the more recent things is that the sea, which is roaring, literally the sea, is full of plastic, which is poisoning the fish and destroying uh, the ecosystem for which so many people in the world depend. And so it is true that we are living in a uniquely awful age in so many ways. But is that what Luke is talking about? If you come to uh, Matthew chapter 24, let's have a, a look at the Olivet Prophecy uh, for a minute or two. In Matthew chapter 24, uh, I'll just say that, of course, the Olivet Prophecy is, is the subject of endless debate, isn't it? How much of it is AD 70 and how much of it is latter day? In Matthew chapter 24, Brother Thomas uh, says in his writing, verse 29 is AD 70, and verse 30 is latter day. And I think he's absolutely right on that. Verse 29 describes the, the lights of the Jewish commonwealth going out. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The Jewish commonwealth would be overturned, and then verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Now, I know there are brethren who have written well on the subject, suggesting that all of uh, the prophecy, including verse 30 and onwards, is AD 70. I think myself that is very difficult uh, to swallow. Verse 30 is talking about the tribes of the earth mourning, a reference to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 12, when the Jewish people in Jerusalem, in the siege of Jerusalem, accept the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom they crucified. They shall look upon him whom they pierced, and they shall mourn. 
in clouds with power and great glory. The question then from the perspective of Brother Thomas's interpretation is, how do you get 2,000 years in between verse 29 and 30? It just runs on. Surely verse 30 and verse 29, they're part of a piece. I think the answer is this, that the Matthew and Mark record is not giving us a total picture. Clearly, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a summary of what the Lord Jesus Christ said. And they're presented to us to develop certain lines of thought. And Matthew and Mark are telling us about the future of the Judah's commonwealth. And they're telling us when the temple would be destroyed. And then the Lord Jesus would come. To them, not even in Acts chapter 1 that there would be a long time of gentle downtreading. Judah's commonwealth would be destroyed. And then, after that, would appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then, the Lord Jesus Christ would restore Israel to uh, covenant relationship with God. I know that there's problems again with that view. And as I say, the debates are endless. Uh, but let's just think about this. Do you think the Lord gave us an ambiguous prophecy that might not be understood? Or is the ambiguity, if there is such a thing, deliberate? Causing us to be engaged with this. And when we come to Luke chapter 21, as I'd like to do now, it's clear. It's clear when we come to Luke chapter 21, the Lord Jesus, in that Olivet prophecy, did talk about Gentile times. Well, Matthew doesn't include it, and Mark doesn't include it. Luke does. So the Lord did talk about Gentile times. And I'd like to suggest that the uh, dilemma we're in is because the Lord was talking about two things simultaneously. That, that, that is, there is a parallel between the Jewish downtreading and what will happen at the end of Gentile times. So when we look at chapter 21 and uh, this passage here, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the nations until the times of the nations be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. And so it reads uh, through the word Gentiles, the word nations are, are one and the same, separating in different, giving them different uh, translations, actually, uh, seems to confuse the point. So the distress of nations of verse 25, I would like to suggest, are not the distress of non-Jewish people in the land of Palestine when the Romans invaded, but those same nations in verse 24, which have trodden down Jerusalem, and now at the time, at the end of the time, of the Gentiles themselves have a time of trouble such as never was when men's hearts would fail them for fear for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth and that's the basis on which I, I will proceed that the sea and the waves roaring there has to do with Gentile trouble some might say, oh, but the sun, moon, and stars are Jewish. You already said that. Well, I've suggested that the Lord is speaking about Jewish and Gentile sun, moon, and stars. Just put up three passages here, Isaiah 13, Ezekiel 32, and Joel 3. And if you look at them, you'll see each of them talks about the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof. For example, Isaiah 13, shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause a light to shine. What's that talking about? Isaiah 13 is talking about Babylon. The lights of Babylon will go out. The ruling bodies, the powers of Babylon, the empire of Babylon will be removed. Its ruling class, its priestly class will be disposed of when the Persians come and take it over. Ezekiel 32, verse 7 to 9. I will cover the heaven, make the stars that are dark. I will cover the sun with the cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon thy land. What's it talking about? Egypt. As Babylon comes down against Egypt and takes over the Egyptian empire. Let's turn to Joel chapter 3 and look at that one. Uh, in a little bit more detail, Joel chapter 3. Uh, 
And here we're clearly in an Armageddon context. Joel chapter 3, verse 12 says, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about, put he in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Then we're told in verse 15, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Yahweh also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But Yahweh will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So quite clearly in the prophets, the sun, moon, and stars, and the signs of the heavens shaking have to do with, as well as Jewish Gentile times, and here in Joel chapter 3, clearly are talking about the context of the latter days. What about the concept of the waters, the sea and the waves? Well, let's go to the book of Revelation and see there some of these uh, clear passages which give us the basis for identifying the sea and the waves as the movement, the churning of the peoples of the earth. The woman, the harlot, false church in Revelation 17 verse 1 is described upon as sitting upon many waters. And verse 15 is the explanation. He saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and tongues and nations and tongues. Oh, it's interesting. There are four descriptors there. Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. What's the difference between them? What's the difference between a nation and a people, between a multitude and a people, between a multitude and nations, or, or peoples and tongues? What's the difference? And it's difficult to define them precisely. And that actually is quite a point itself, because the world has a problem, you know used to think of there were Spanish people. <laughs> but actually there are Catalonians in Spain who don't feel themselves to be as Spanish as they feel that they are Catalonian. And they want to be their own separate people. Yes, but they're Spanish. They got Spanish passports, so they're the nation of Spain. Yes, but they're Different, are they different ethnically? I don't know what the genetics tells us, but I suspect genetically they're no different from other Spaniards. Uh, but they've got their own language, Catalan. So you see, the, the world has a problem in discriminating. What, what do you mean by a nation? Are the Jews a people? Are they a nation? Are they an ethnic group? That's always been the dilemma. What is it to be a Jew? Call yourself a Jew, does it make you a Jew? I think that's really fascinating because four different terms are used to describe the peoples. And although I can't identify precisely, I, I suggest that what we're talking about is ethnic groups. Ethnos is the word for nation. Ethnic groups, inhabitants of the land, which may not be all of one ethnic group. Different peoples, different cultures that are mingled together and different languages. So we can look at the peoples of the world from the way they're organized, from the way they uh, socialize, from where they live and how they speak. And Revelation sees this woman sort of sitting upon those. In chapter 14 and verse 6, we have their... Uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of the age going out to command the peoples of the world to obey. And this is how it describes it, 14 verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred, kindred and tongue and people. So that descriptor is one which describes the, the world when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. It's not describing the world in terms of the 
powers that rule, what empires will there be? What kings will lord it over the nations? But it's describing the people. It is the emergence of the people, which is the characteristic of the age in which we live. And when the people make a sound, well, chapter 19, verse 6 tells us what it's like. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thunderings. When the people move, when the people churn, when there is upheaval amongst the masses, it is as the sound of many waters, the sea and the waves roaring. And then we find that there are passages of scripture which talk about that as a, as a picture of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring peace and tranquility to a troubled world. In Psalm 93 and verse 4, it's clearly a passage that has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4 of Psalm 93 says, Yahweh on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. And the psalm begins, Yahweh reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. He is mightier than the power of the peoples, than the surging of societies and the churning of the nations. The Lord Jesus Christ walked upon the sea. A picture of ruling in power. Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah talk about the Lord smiting the waves or dividing the sea. And it takes us back to Exodus when God divided the sea to let his people pass through. So the, the nations are going to be in turmoil and the Lord is going to make a path through the nations for his people to return. And that's what we want to look at in our next section. So would you come to Revelation chapter 11, please. And uh, we just... Uh, taking a broad view of, of where we are in terms of the trends, a uh, framework for understanding the trends uh, in the society in which we live. The idea that Revelation chapter 11 is about France, from the first time you hear about this, you think, oh, that's, that's a bit strange. But the closer you look into Revelation chapter 11, we've done it in uh, Mumble's Bible class in uh, uh, about a year ago now, we went through uh, Revelation, the, the closer you look the more convincing, I think, it seems. And actually, when you realize that Bible students, even before the times of Revelation 11, were anticipating it, uh, it gives it even more um, power. What we get in Revelation chapter 11, verse 13, was it's a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city falls. The earthquake of the French Revolution, and the tenth part one of the ten powers that emerged on the Roman territory would fall. Which of those ten? And writers of the time said, well, it's got to be France. Scene of Revelation chapter 11. And out of that came forces which have shaped our modern world. Out of that earthquake came liberty, equality, and fraternity. Those had witnessed against the oppressive, corrupt powers of church and state were defeated in chapter 11 temporarily. Very interestingly, look at verse 9. It says, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So even at the time of that witness against the corruption of church and state, which would have put Christadelphians to death at the earliest opportunity, it's as if the masses are waiting. They won't allow 
the visible uh, bodies of the opposition to disappear. They're waiting. And of course, that revolution allowed the peoples, kindreds, and tongues, and nations to surge to form that age, which is the age of the common man, as it was called. The age of the common man. When we come to Revelation chapter 16, we find that the consequences now of that revolution in France are exploding upon the Holy Roman Empire. In chapter 16, the Holy Roman Empire is going to be uh, dismembered by the forces unleashed. We come down to verse 12 with the sixth angel. We find that the great river Euphrates, the Ottoman power, the Turkish Empire itself is going to be the subject of judgment. And the waters thereof were dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The waters drying up. God is going to make a way through the sea. He's going to make a path through the waters that his people might return. Ultimately, the kingdom of God. But a necessary step before that, the return of the Jews into the territory of the Ottoman Empire. And at the time of these things, verse 13 speaks about three unclean spirits, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons working miracles, which go forth of the kings of the whole earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And we're still waiting for those policies to come out of the mouth of Europe and the papacy and the uh, Russian empire to bring about that final conflict but those spirits have been unleashed into the world from the french revolution we identify them with the french spirits not because there are three frogs on a flag somewhere but because this is what revelation is leading us to understand that chapter 11 of revelation is about the french who overturned the oppressing powers and then, through Napoleon, destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, which is the subject of so much of the book of Revelation. It was the spirits of the people that were unleashed, the nations, peoples, multitudes and tongues, that were let loose. Oh, I find this very interesting, that if you look at chapter 16, of course, you'll see lots of references back to to Exodus and to the plagues of Egypt. I don't need, I'm sure, to point these out. You've probably got them marked in, going all the way uh, down from verse, uh, verse 2 down, the, the reference to the plagues of Egypt. And the frogs, the frogs come out of the, the destruction of the Nile, being turned to blood in Exodus. We also know that the plagues of Egypt were directed against the gods of Egypt. So what was the god associated with the frog? Her name was Heket. She was a frog goddess who symbolized the fertility of the land. And she was a midwife. Interestingly, it was taught at one of her shrines that she came out of the mouth of Ra himself. Three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth seems to capture the mythology that is being attacked by the scriptures in Exodus. So what was she going to give birth to? What was this uh, development going to give birth to? But back in Exodus chapter 8, these frogs were everywhere. These frogs were no respecter of persons. They got into everybody's room. Didn't matter if you were a prince or a pauper, they were there. They were no respecter of boundaries. They were no respecters of social class. They were common as mud. <laughs> Coming out of the mud of the river, they rose up and swarmed across the land. I'd like to suggest that what Hecate gave birth to 
was the birth of nations. The spirit of the modern age, democracy, socialism, and nationalism. The French Revolution paved the way for the modern nation state and also the big part in the birth of nationalism, the sea and the waves roaring. The exists before all. It is the origin of everything. Its will is always legal. It is the law itself. The French Revolution gave birth to nationalism and the nation state. And that came into the drying up of the river Euphrates. The rise of the Western notion of nationalism under the Ottoman Empire eventually caused the breakdown of the Ottoman millet concept. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? But what we are to expect into that vacuum created by the drying up of the Ottoman Empire was the emergence of the fig tree and all the trees. And how interesting, a little known fact, little known by me anyway, till recently, it was Napoleon himself, who was the first world leader to propose the re-establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, place the Ottoman Empire. In fact, in this picture, he has been fated by the Jews as their emancipator. And he was premature because he didn't actually conquer Palestine. The British defeated him at Acre. But uh, he was anticipating he was going to get to Jerusalem. And he wrote a letter to the Jews of the world. Bonaparte, commander-in-chief of the armies of the French Republic in Africa and Asia, to the rightful heirs of Palestine. And he says, come back, restore your kingdom. So the drying up of the river Euphrates would lead to the way of the kings of the east being prepared. And the spirits of the French Revolution would lead to the emergence of nationalism that would ultimately see the birth of Israel. That nationalism was uh, knew no boundaries. It wasn't just Jewish. In fact, Jewish nationalism came rather late in the day. In, in uh, Europe, Germany came together. Italy came together. Nationalism occurred in other parts as well. In Wales. And you might think this is uh, uh, a bit far-fetched, but it is the case, brothers and sisters that Welsh nationalism was one of the formative influences of the creation of the State of Israel. How strange! You see, the man who is credited with being the father of the Balfour Declaration, not Balfour, but David Lloyd George, was brought up in a strict biblical Sunday school in North Wales, couldn't get it out of his head, Bible prophecy, but in his political career was a Welsh nationalist. So that when Hay hey Weizmann was trying to make the case in 1917, 100 years ago, for the homeland, this is what he said. We have arrived at the supreme moment in world history. The map of the world is to be remade. All we want is something the size of Wales. <laughs> How would you get Wales into the supreme moment of world history? <laughs> because those spirits that had been unleashed of nationalism went out into all the earth to create this sense of movement and churn that would lead ultimately and god used a man brought up on the most inconspicuous and inconsequential place in the world that's why they said the size of waves you're not asking for much <laughs> just just the size of waves it wasn't a compliment it was the opposite he used such a man 
to have such a sympathy with the Jewish people that he couldn't but help himself tip the balance in favor of the Jewish nation. So when the Balfour Declaration was or wasn't going to happen, made it happen. A book's been written about the Welsh at that time had a very particular identification with the Jews. The Jews in some way, notional and historical, are embedded in Welsh consciousness in the 19th and 20th centuries. Isn't that amazing that the spirits, the frog-like spirits, got into the clean peninsula in North Wales <laughs> and created the mentality in a man who God would then use, despite all his failings and faults, to instigate the return of the Jews to their land. Of course, that was just part of it. Lloyd George himself said that acetone made him a Zionist. Because, of course, Weizmann discovered a process of making acetone for explosives that the Minister of Munitions was very, very keen on. But after that First World War, this principle of self-determination would shape the world. The principle coming out of that French Revolution would shape the world. And in the territory of the Ottoman Empire, new nation states began to emerge. And there they are today. And the process hasn't stopped. The fig tree and all the trees. Those nations were united together in the League of Nations in 1922 to create a, an international forum which gave to Britain the mandate for Palestine. Those spirits created the way of the kings of the East. And they had a covenant binding them together to achieve international peace and security. So that phrase, peace and security, or peace and safety, when they shall say peace and safety, say, well, people have always said that. No, they haven't. They haven't always said it. They've said it since about 1917. It's become the, the objective of the cooperation of nation states that have been born in our modern era. And the United Nations was founded in 1945. Can anybody read that? I, I, I can't see it. Imagine there's a big banner saying United Nations founded in 1945. And the writing says at the end of World War II, over a third of the world's population lived in dependent territories. Dependent territories. But they broke free. The state of Israel was born in Africa. Uh, new nations emerged. In Asia, new nations emerged. The most recent new nation, South Sudan, racked by conflict, the sea and the waves roaring, ethnic groups fighting each other for scarce resources. And the Arab Spring, the nations, the ethnic groups, the different cultures and tribes and languages churning and roaring. And there's been talk that the breakup of Iraq and Syria will lead to the creation of new states. And we've seen that this week with the Kurds voting to create their own independent homeland. You see, the sea and the waves is still roaring. The bid for independence. And the one perhaps which is of most significance, will there be a Palestinian homeland? And will that be the trigger for the final conflict? The nations of the world voted overwhelmingly that Palestine should be a non-member observer state. Only nine voted against the nations of the world uh, roaring against Israel. And all of that leads to the trends that are going on in the world. The migration of peoples 
fleeing conflict, then leading to cultural clashes, the rise of neo-Nazis in German Bundestag leads to forebodings and fears for what is coming upon the world. The Rohingya refugees being ethnically cleansed, the sea and the waves roaring. But the second aspect of nationalism is the first that came out of the French Revolution, but the second aspect, and sisters and people, has to do with what the troubled sea churns up. It casts up mire and dirt. The, the age of the common man, of course that's not acceptable now, the age of the, co the, age of the common person uh, casts up mire and dirt. The French Revolution was the birth of the Declaration of Human Rights. That's where they were given birth. Right? Heket was doing her job. She gave birth to human rights and those got absorbed into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations. And Articles 1 and 2 of the Declaration of Human Rights establish the basic concepts of liberty, equality, and brotherhood. That's the three spirits of the French Revolution. They've taken form in the United Nations in terms of rights, rights of individuals. And the United Nations, when it organizes the nations of the world together, has an organization for promoting those rights through education through culture uh, and through training, UNESCO. And so the spirit of the age in which we live, the spirit of our education system, is formulated by the spirits that can be traced back to chapter 11, chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. And what is that spirit of individual rights? It's a humanism. Humanism is UNESCO's moral intellectual DNA, the evolutionary philosophy of UNESCO. That's what we're talking about. That is the spirit of the age in which we live. And it's a sign of the times because you can trace the development of these processes through the book of Revelation. Now the Lord only said a couple of sentences, didn't he? In the waves roaring, he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. And he's just giving us a clue, a hint, as to what's going to emerge. But as we can see, the forces have been unleashed. Oh, I'd like, oh, excuse me for a minute. Oh, you're still there. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Let's face up to the problem, brothers and sisters. Consider ourselves. There's never been a world like the one we're living in, has there? Absolutely never been such a world. And our young people are unique, uniquely disadvantaged. They are the me, me, me generation. They don't have to be. But the default is that they will be unless we do something about it. And you see, what I wanted just to say, brothers and sisters, is that those forces which were unleashed and which shaped societies, you might say, they took generations to develop, didn't they? They took generations. Sometimes in history, they came to a point in time. Here was this, this, <laughs> this common Welshman brought up in a cottage, finding himself at the center of power in 1922, at the Paris Peace Conference, carving up the map of the world, and his biographer says he couldn't get his Sunday school lessons out of his head. He kept reciting names of places in the Bible, his biographer says, many of whom no longer existed. So things can come to a sharp focus at times. 
but they might take a generation to develop. But what's happened with the technology since the World Wide Web is that these trends have gone at such a pace as to have overwhelmed us. So, my little, little uh, visual aid joke. When the world starts to warn us, brothers and sisters, we ought to take notice. This isn't, uh, here he goes again, having a go at Facebook. As you notice, I've got a smartphone in a very unsmart pocket. <laughs> and you were at a Bible school in the summer in, uh, in uh, Oregon, uh, and there was a brother sitting in front of us, and he was brought into the truth over the internet. Turn around and say, hello, brother, how are you doing? He's never belonged to an ecclesia. That's fantastic. So there are benefits. But when the world says this, we ought to take notice. So, Generation Z, those born since 1995. How many of us here born since 1995? That's a few. Okay, you're Generation Z, okay? You've got a smartphone? Absolutely, you have a smartphone, right? No, somebody's shaking their head. You don't have to have a smartphone. In fact, I know two families in California where they didn't have Facebook or smartphones. Right? So you don't have to, but I've got them. Now, unfortunately, I've been going for so long, way beyond a couple of seconds, that you lost me, haven't you? <laughs> because your attention span is only a couple of seconds. <laughs> Well, this is what Generation Z is about. Instant gratification. Attention span of a couple of seconds. That's, that's the society. Uh, could it get worse? I mean, you could have no attention span, I suppose. And, uh, well, you can't get faster than instant, so I don't know where you go from here. The digital revolution is turning lifestyles and mentalities upside down. The intuitiveness, immediacy, and connectivity which characterizes new information and communication technologies appeal to teenagers who find in them ways to gain recognition from their peers and to exchange with each other without having to yield to adults. That, then, sisters, is the new generation. Is that a sign of the times? There is a generation. Proverbs chapter 30 says, Oh, how lofty are their eyes. Now, I'm not saying our young people have fallen into that, but that's the task to stop it happening. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation Oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives. And if any of you have gone on to chat rooms, see Christadelphian chat rooms, and read the stuff there, you will see people whose words are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives. And their brethren and sisters, talking about other brethren and sisters. This is the sign of the times about taking heed to ourselves. When the main line media, right, the main broadsheet papers and the BBC start asking whether smartphones have destroyed a generation about Facebookaholics, then, sisters, we have to really look to ourselves. There's now data from the last five years to say that rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed. It's not an exaggeration to describe the I generation as being on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades. Much of this deterioration can be traced to their phones. 
The data suggests a straight-line relationship between mental health symptoms and the use of an iPhone over an hour a day. Now, that's what the world is telling us. This isn't brothers and sisters, you know, worrying. This is the data that uh, this is professor, professor of uh, psychology at San Diego University, California, publicized on the BBC website, is pointing out that the more time you spend on your iPhone, now it's not, it's not, it's not that the iPhone, it's not that it's being used for um, wrong purposes, because there's always that. It's not that, it's that the way the person's mind is interacting, you know, that's what I'm saying, you know, that I'm not having a conversation with you because I'm worrying whether they like me or not. I'm worrying whether there's any answer. I'm worrying whether anybody's replied. I, uh, I, I, just, I just can't live without it. It's, it's an addiction. It is an addiction that is being pointed to. Twin rise of the smartphone and social media has caused, look at it says, an earthquake. An earthquake of a magnitude we've not seen in a very long time, if ever. And it's making young people seriously unhappy. So we've got a task, brothers and sisters, to create an environment for, with our young people where we get some rules in place. Now, there are apps you can buy, which uh, or, or free, I expect, which control the amount of time you spend. And that's the sort of thing that the world is saying needs now to be introduced. So if we're giving our youngsters smartphones, parents, we have to take seriously the consequences of what we're doing. And we have to talk about that ourselves. You know, some of our exhortations, I think, we're still talking about sitting quietly before the meeting starts as, as the measure of, you know, that's what exhortations are for. No, we've got to talk about how we behave, how we take heed to ourselves. Because through the technology comes the whole spirit of the age, which has shaped nations and now shaping the minds and making them seriously unhappy. A crisis of an earthquake proportions in the mental health of young people. That's what the world is telling us. Can just see the black line. Well, what this is, this is uh, the introduction of the iPhone, and this is the report of young people feeling lonely. Since, uh, we talked about five years ago, since the introduction of the iPhone, the rate of reports of young people feeling lonely have shot up. It's happened in the last five years. And people my age, you know, have not a clue what is going on. So, I looked it up on the medical uh, database to see what was going on. And I came across this smartphone addiction. And there are withdrawal symptoms, anxiety, irritability, impatience. In fact, police say that uh, young people sometimes attack their parents violently when they are threatened with uh, loss of their iPhone. The prevalence of smartphone addiction, 6% in Italy, 38% in Spain, 28% in the Netherlands, 25% in the United States, 60%, 67 in United, didn't have a date, any data for the UK. The prevalence of addiction to the smartphone. The independent newspaper, the liberal newspaper, what's it say? Giving your child a smartphone is like giving them a gram of cocaine. So they suggest a six-step program for breaking your smartphone addiction. Now, what happens, brothers and sisters, is that if we don't take this seriously, and it's not just teenagers, of course, it's me as well, isn't it? You know, I want to know what my emails are saying. I want to know if somebody's replied. What's the latest news? You know, what's the rugby score? Right? The problem is, it affects the way we think. It, it, it funnels humanistic thought into our minds. And this is the spirit of the age. There is no absolute truth. What's true for you, what's true for me, is more important. Therefore, we have to be tolerant and open, 
and, ex uh, and inclusive of all lifestyles and all ways. Whatever the word of God says, yeah, but that's, that's yesterday's stuff. Surely God accepts us just the way we are. The only thing that's wrong today is to be right. And therefore, what, it's interesting, you know, what happens is you get what's called communities of dialogue set up through social media. So this isn't the ecclesia anymore. Uh, the ecclesia doesn't exist as such. It's a community of dialogue where you will find somebody of like mind across the world who is instantly available to reinforce your own issues. And in that dialogue, the dialogue itself is more important than the conclusion. Searching for truth is out of date. Acceptance of many views is the current mode. That relationships are more important than belief. That warm and fuzzy is better than hard facts. Everyone has a story, and we must listen and accept everyone's story. Now, if that mentality, well, it is, isn't it? It is. It is affecting the way we think. We need to face up to the fact that the scriptures tell us that there is a prince ruling over those airwaves. Yeah? The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What we're trying to say, let's not allow, let's do what we can to stop our children being that generation. And let us provide instead in the vacuum that will create the wonderfully wholesome consideration of the word of God in a warm and loving and friendly atmosphere. Let us together search the scriptures, keeping our eyes open for the things that tell us of the nearness of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure, brothers and sisters, that if that's our aim, then the Lord will richly bless us until the master comes.